Christ had been killed. And yet this doctrine survived. So I want, I want to tell you that shortly after the war, it had a resurrection in the Soviet Union and was to remain in the Soviet Union in clandestine fashion, meaning every public official said he was opposed to anti-Semitism. But Jews couldn't get into universities, they couldn't get into certain jobs, no leading job in the Communist Party. What they could do, they could become a, a physician, a dentist, a lawyer, whatever, but their opportunities were very, very strictly limited. But now occurs the great shift. I mean, anti-Semitism had existed in Russia. And what happened in Russia was a sign, certainly that, as a doctrine, as an ideology. It was not easily crushed or defeated because its foundation, its basis, had nothing at all to do with reality. It had to do with the what? The psychological needs of political propaganda in the countries where people were. Did I mention to you the, the new controversy, the new provocation? The new provocation, of course, is the arrival of Zionism in the Middle East. And the arrival of Zionism in the Middle East now introduces the anti-Semitic infection, if you will, into the Arab and Muslim world. Now, you have to understand, and this remains a dispute, and I. I want to deal with it. Um, certainly, uh, in the Muslim world, it is denied that there is any anti-Semitism. Basically, the hostility to the Jew is the hostility not to the Jew, but to the state of Israel. And in fact, if the state of Israel would cease to exist, if Zionism would go away, then indeed there would be what? No hostility. It's not anti-Semitism. And that, by the way, I'm sure has a certain legitimacy, except, let me just give you a story. Um, recently in the New York Times, and I, you know, the first thing when I wake up in the morning before my coffee, it's the New York Times, okay. Uh, recently in the New York Times, there was an article about what's going on in Egypt. In Egypt, uh, there is a new uh, drama program. Uh, which started out as a book and was turned into a, you can't call it a sitcom because it isn't a comedy, or, I mean, all right, all right, fine. Uh, but it's like, you know, it's an ongoing it's a chapter after, it's the Golden Girls only series. Okay, fine. And at the heart of the story is the story of the Jews and their evil. Now, it's one thing to have a story about the state of Israel and how it took away the land of the, the Palestinians. But it's another thing to have a story which doesn't talk about how uh, Palestine was taken away, but a story that turns the Jews into a demonic and evil force. And in fact, the propaganda sounds very much like the propaganda that came out of European anti-Semitism because the book that is cited to demonstrate that this is true is the chief book of European anti-Semitism, The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is on public TV. So when did this happen? Let me try to date it. When anti-Jewish feeling arose in the Arab and Muslim world, it was certainly a function of what we call the Zionist provocation. Okay. And in fact, there were many, many people who were not hostile to Jews, but who were hostile to the idea of a Jewish state in the Muslim world. Okay. But then, in order to <laughs> mobilize the masses, to offer resistance to Israel, you have to beat the drums. Now the man who beat the drums 
was an Egyptian military leader by the name of Gamal Abdel Nasser. And his great aim was to unite the entire Arab nation and using the power of the United Arab Nation with the help of the Soviet Union to crush and defeat the State of Israel. But that didn't happen because in 1967, after a six-day war, Gamal Abdel Nasser was decisively defeated. And it is after 1967 that the nature of Arab and Muslim propaganda begins to change. Because you have to ask the question. The question is, how did a small state defeat the united power of the Arab world? The answer is not through its own strength. The answer that now emerged and is part part of the propaganda that circulates. That's, and that propaganda is not simply anti-Israel, it's anti-Semitic. The answer is the following. The reason why Israel was able to defeat the Arab nation in 1967 was not because of its own power, but because Israel is only a colony of the United States of America. And the United States of America is controlled by the Jews. And in fact, the capital of the Jewish world is not Tel Aviv, it is New York, the financial center of the, of the world. So it was not that the Arab nation was defeated by the little state of Israel, it was that the Arab nation was defeated by this world conspiracy this demonic force that holds the world in its clutches, the Jews. And now what we find is that the center of anti-Semitic propaganda, see there is no anti-Semitic propaganda in Russia because you're, you're not allowed to what? <laughs> you're not, you can do it privately but you can't do it what? You can't do it publicly. The center of anti-Semitic propaganda gradually shifts from Europe, strangely enough, into the Muslim world where it is an irony, to say the least. Because if there is one thing the Arab people are, it is Semitic. <laughs> no, no, is, that, is that not? No, no, I mean, it, it, it's ironic. It's as though uh, anti-American uh, uh, Indian propaganda should shift to Peru, you know, where the, most of the people are what? <laughs> are India. I mean, then you say, it, it, it's, it's bizarre. But it's true. It, it moved. And in fact, if you're talking about the 1970s and the 1980s, that's where it lies. And what I want to do now, because that's to talk about the new anti-Semitism in Europe, I have to explain how having moved from Europe to the Muslim world, it comes back to Europe. If you'll join me in five minutes, I will explain. Thank you. Now, um, what I want to do is bring our focus back to Europe. I spoke to you about the Great Shift, and the Great Shift occurred after the Holocaust and after the Second uh, World War, and it was certainly uh, aided by what happened in 1967. Um, certainly today, if you want the most overt forms of anti-Semitism, uh, which echo some of the statements you might have found even in uh, Nazi Germany, then you would not find them in Europe, because in Europe, in many cases, there are laws against what? I mean, you, you, you can't publish that kind of propaganda. You might find it somewhere in uh, the former Soviet Union, but not uh, what I would call from the establishment. But you will find it uh, in the media the press and TV, and even school books, 
um, in the Arab and sometimes even in the broader Muslim world. It's one of the great ironies because certainly prior to the Second World War, anti-Semitism as an ideology didn't, didn't exist in the, in the Muslim world. Its center was in Europe. It's an odd transfer. You know, hist history is sometimes bizarre. <laughs> All right. So let's look at Europe at the end of the Second World War. At the end of the Second World War, there's this big hole in the middle where most of the Jews were, it's what? Nobody. I mean, yeah, no Jews. Uh, Jews are on the fringe. Uh, the three largest Jewish communities of Europe are England, which has somewhere around 300,000 Jews, and at the end of the Second World War, there is France, that has somewhere around 200 or 250,000 Jews. And then you got to skip all the way over uh, to Russia, which has locked up, uh, you know, some three million Jews uh, behind, the, uh, behind the Iron Curtain. And in the middle, it's either cemeteries, do you understand, or museums. Gone. Now, after World War II, between what I would call 1945 and 1967 and 68, there are only minor outbursts of anti-Semitism and they're generally disguised because the laws prevent you from saying anything overt. You can't get up and say it out loud. You have to do it in a kind of disguised uh, fashion. Uh, first of all, I told you about Soviet hostility, right? So immediately after the Second World War, the Jews are confronted with his hostility. Fortunately, Stalin dies in 1953. And he's followed by Khrushchev and then Brezhnev. And under Khrushchev and Brezhnev, the pressure is relieved. But there is what I would call an unofficial anti-Semitism. Never official, but what? Unofficial. Uh, now, in the 1960s in Poland, uh, it, it emerges slightly. I went to visit Poland actually in 1972 uh, to go back to find the, the small towns from which my parents came. All right. And uh, along the way I traveled through most of Poland and uh, I was on, on the edge, the end of uh, a kind of anti-Semitic campaign that had been going on for about five years, uh, triggered by a man in the Polish government, the defense minister by the name of Mochar, M-O-C-Z-A-R, uh, uh, which actually drove out of Poland. Poland had, at the end of the war, uh, some 250,000 Jews left out of a population of three and a half million. Most of them fled because there were anti-Semitic pogroms following the, uh, the war, and there was a population of 25,000. And when I got there, most of the 25,000 had fled. There were only 5,000 that had remained. And, but the campaign, uh, which was triggered, interestingly enough, by the events of the 1967 war. Um, the campaign was never officially anti-Semitic. That is, Mochar never said, I hate Jews. It was just that Jews were eliminated from important jobs in the government. Uh, Jews found it difficult to enter into certain uh, universities and places. I mean, that, it's what I call, un it's unofficial and not official. If you asked anybody, is there an anti-Semitic policy around here? I mean, you know, of course not. We're a socialist country. We believe in the end of anti-Semitism, all discrimination. Thank you very much. Good. All right. I got a lot of that. And in France in the 1950s, there was an interesting movement uh, led by a man called Poujade. I don't know whether you remember Poujade. Poujade was a, the champion of a small businessman. And uh, in the 1950s, there was a struggle on the part of the French economy to recover. The West German economy was sailing uh, like this, and the French economy was having trouble getting off the ground after the end of the war. But uh, toward the middle and the end of the 1950s, 
there now uh, emerge new investments. And what was happening in, uh, in France was the arrival of big, big business, big corporations. Now, we all know that from the story of America. Big business and big corporations are not the friend of small business. Do you remember all the small bookstores we used to have? No, no, I love Borders. Don't, 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 don't get me wrong. Do you remember all the small bookstores we used to have around here, right? They're all, they're all gone because how are they going to survive against the chain? How are the small shops going to survive against the department stores? Sir Pujad, it was an interesting movement. I remember I was very, very inter interested in it. Um, Pujad uh, organized a political party, and he got a lot of votes. Uh, basically, it was built on what he considered to be the conspiracy against small business, led by the people who were in charge of big business. Now, in the French mind, the people, and it's not true, who organize department stores are Jews. Therefore, the department, you know, the, the department stores are putting the what? The small shops and the small stores um, out of business. And so the Pujad campaign had an element. I mean, it was, you could very easily translate. They, they couldn't ever use the word what? Jew, but anybody who read it could, uh, could translate. It was clearly anti-Semitic, and many of the people he appealed to were people who had supported the Vichy regime uh, before. There was that edge, but in the end it failed because the French economy then went sailing and, uh, and the French got caught up in another controversy, which made Israel the chief ally of France. And that was the war in Algeria. I don't think people realize that the first strong ally of Israel was France. It's hard to remember since Charles de Gaulle wasn't very friendly. But the French and the Israelis shared a common enemy, bringing us the principle, which I hate to repeat. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. All right. The enemy of the French in Algeria were the Arabs, and the enemy of the Israelis in Israel were the Arabs. So now the enemy of my enemy is my friend. They all come together, and so uh, and that only lasted until de Gaulle decided to give up Algeria. Remember, he came to power saying he would defend Algeria, and then he gave it up. But it's all right. It was a good thing to do. It was not appropriate for him to hang on to Algeria. But uh, so things changed. There was that Pujad move. Everything was sort of disguised in Europe. If it existed, it could never be overt. It was always implied, and it wasn't very strong because during this period of time, uh, whatever Jews there were in Western Europe, certainly in England and France or Italy or whatever, were doing extremely well. The economy was booming in Western Europe and the Jews found themselves uh, in a society which was pretty much open for them, certainly after the Holocaust. But then there occurred the transformation. And in fact, it was simultaneous with the 1967 war. Um, I was in Paris in 1968. Uh, that was the year of the great, uh, uh, the great rebellion you, that brought down de Gaulle. Um, the students and everybody rose up in Paris. They put graffiti. It was the beginning of graffiti on the wall in France. I mean, the whole thing, it was the rebellion. And it was all related to another war that was going on that you may remember. When I talk to people that are my contemporaries and I say pre-war, they, they know I mean the Second World War. But when I talk to younger people and I say pre-war, they think of the Viet, no, no. <laughs> You know, there's the Vietnam War, the Second World War, that's ancient, uh, that's ancient history. Okay. So there was the Vietnam War, remember, going on, uh, going on simultaneously. It was the 1960s, and do you remember what happened to people in America in the 1960s, to young people? I mean, the transformation, the hair got longer, the politics got redder, whatever it is. It was, was a, an overwhelming change. And in fact, the 1960s produced around the world, because of the Vietnam War, a very strong anti-Americanism. I mean, 
there were, there were strong anti-American uh, trends because America was now regarded as the what? This fascist, oppressive nation trying to destroy the Vietnamese. So if you, if you understand that context, then you understand that in addition to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, there was this major conflict that was going on and in fact it triggered in Europe the rise of what appeared in America. It's called the New Left. The New Left is different from the Old Left. The Old Left are the socialists and the communists. They're disciplined. They have families. Uh, and they don't take off their clothes <laughs> during a rebellion. No, 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 no. In, in many cases, the Old Left had what I call bourgeois values. No, I mean, the way they dress, the way they talk, I mean, other than their demonstrations. But the new left now is caught up in what I call the new lifestyle. Uh, the old left can't stand the new left because they're so undisciplined, but they're led by these students who now take over. In fact, their parents don't even know what to do. I mean, they're absolutely discombobulated by the assault. Do you recall that assault? All right. Major. And, in fact, the new left is overwhelmingly anti-American. Not only anti-American in Europe, it's anti-American here. I mean, it, when I say anti-American, it's, it's opposed to the American government. It hates Lyndon Baines Johnson, the whole thing. So out of it comes the new left. Now, the old left in Europe had been divided. I mean, the communists, of course, were pro-Soviet Union. But the socialist parties, who were the moderate part of the old left, had been staunchly pro-American because they hated Stalinism and they hated, uh, they hated the Soviet Union. So, but the new left was not into hating the Soviet Union. They, they were sort of uh, beyond it. Their focus, primarily, was anti-Americanism. Was anti and it was true in America, and it was also true in, uh, in Europe, and it was fed by this unfortunate uh, war. And then about the same time, because it was after 1967 uh, and the Six-Day War, there arose a new group of people who were demanding their independence. It was called the Palestinians. Remember? Yasser Arafat shows up in the early 1970s. And in fact, he becomes a hero of the New Left. And the New Left persists uh, in Europe. It, it ultimately is to produce a series of parties. Uh, one of the issues of the New Left, which is a legitimate issue, was the issue of the environment, which produced a party called the Greens. Many of the people of the New Left ended up in a party which sometimes get five to, gets 5 to 10 percent of the vote in France or Germany. They're called the Green, uh, they're called the Green Party. Uh, and in fact, what corresponds to them in America would be Ralph Nader. No, no, no. I mean, if you understand Ralph Nader, then you understand uh, this party because Ralph Nader is what's left over from the what? He's what's left over from uh, the new left, but the numbers in Europe are far, uh, far greater. And, uh, well, the new left leaves what I would call a lingering force, and the, the enemy of the new left is not the Soviet Union. The enemy of the new left is the United States of, of America and its policies. American policies are always wicked. They always have some kind of uh, alternative agenda, which indeed is, is wicked. It is, never, uh, it is never good. And in fact, that was reinforced by the fact that the Soviet Union actually collapses, right? Goes away. By 1991, it's what? Kaput. It's disappeared. And now the focus of the new left is America. And in fact, not only the Green Party, there emerges another movement from it, which has some legitimacy. Uh, America and the global economy are producing a world in which there are winners and losers. And for the winners, they think it's a terrific economy. <laughs> and for the losers, they think it's a what? It's a terrible economy. It means mass urbanization. It means mass uncertainty. It means inadequate protection for the work of whatever else it is. So the new left, 
I mean, the heirs of the new left in our society, we know them. They demonstrate all over the place. They came to Seattle. They go to Prague. They're called the anti-globalization forces. They are part of what we call the protest against the American economic system, which has now appeared in, uh, in the world. Now, to be politically correct in that world, You always champion the Palestinians. And in fact, the state of Israel does not have a legitimacy because Zionism and the state of Israel are an example of American colonialism. I'm not here to defend or... I, I'm just trying to give you the picture of this, this force. The new left sort of has survived. It, it's taken on various forms, the Green Party, but now it's very strong in what I call the anti-globalization forces, and they're very, very strong. So what now enters uh, into the transformation process is that some of the anti-Israel feeling that, that exists in the Arab and Muslim world now enters into the, the new left, and what happens is, if you're not sophisticated, it's very easy to shift from simply what? Anti-Israel into what we call, uh, pick up the anti-Semitic propaganda. So now that enters not, before it used to be on the right. Now it's entering in on the, on the left. And it's very discombobulating. And of course, if anybody in the new left is accused of anti-Semitism, the statement always is, no, we're not. Uh, we are anti-American government and we're anti-Zionist uh, and so forth. That's how it's put. But in some ways or other, if you look at the propaganda, there are little elements because it's very hard to make the distinction. But it, it's this power of the new left. And what it means is that in Europe now, anti-Semitism uh, or the edge of anti-Semitism, now enters into the left. Oh, it used to be always on the what? On the right. Now it enters into the left. Now there comes a new cause for the new left. It's a very important cause. The cause is the arrival in Europe of hundreds of thousands and millions, that's my last week's talk, millions of Muslim immigrants. Now they're pouring into France, they're pouring into Germany, they're pouring into Austria, and they're encountering unjust discrimination. So now the defense of these immigrants becomes one of the causes, certainly, of the new left. There's no doubt about it. It becomes one of the things, and Simultaneously emerging in Europe is the rise of the new right. The new right is built on fighting the immigrants. So, well, let me give you now the, the drama. The Muslims don't like the Jews. The new right didn't like the Jews, and now they don't like the what? They don't like the Muslims. Are you seeing the, dra are you seeing the drama here? I mean, uh, the, the two groups they don't like don't like, <laughs> don't like each other. Hmm, what a drama. Well, so let me talk about the Muslims coming into Europe. The Muslims coming into Europe experience enormous discrimination. They're necessary, their labor is necessary, nobody thinks they're necessary, but they're pouring in. And in fact, they bring with them the culture of the Middle East, and part of that culture by now is the demonization of Israel and the Jews. Oh. So. What's happening, which is so unfortunate or whatever, anti-Semitism, which had been strong on the right, now re-enters <laughs> through, the, through the left. 
and enters through one of the most unfortunate, victimized, oppressed populations in Europe, namely the Muslims. So now let's talk about the new right. The new right is that group that doesn't like the Muslims. I talked about them last week. Among them is a man called Le Pen. Hmm. He is the leader of the Front National in France. He got almost 15 percent of the vote in normal elections, and then in this last presidential election he goes almost all the way up to 20 percent. I mean, who can believe it? Le Pen worked for the Vichy regime. Le Pen is an anti-Semite. But he hates Muslims more. So, something very interesting happens. It's, just, it, it's the bizarre character of history. So Le Pen calls up the leader of the Jewish community in France that's very, very disturbed by the rise of the Front National. Le Pen is an anti-Semitic party. I mean, he's known as an anti-Semite. And he says to him, don't worry. He says, I wasn't that crazy about Jews, that's true. <laughs> but on the principle of the enemy, of your enemy is my friend, maybe we can get together. Do, 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 do you see how biz do you see how bizarre how bizarre this story is? Well, the Jews are afraid of the Muslims, aren't they? And we don't like them. And we're afraid of them because you're nothing. I mean, you know, compared to this invasion of Europe by the Muslims. Sometimes when you watch history through time, it produces the strangest, strangest phenomena. Well, then there's Haider in Austria, right? He rises up. He's accused of being an anti-Semite, but Heider, Heider gets this Peter Sikhrovsky. Peter Sikhrovsky is one of the leading intellectuals of the Jews in Austria. He says, no, Heider's okay. Well, because Heider's main focus is not hating Jews, it's hating Muslims, and after all, Jews and Muslims don't get along, so maybe, you know, you, uh, you under, don't, don't you understand? Who could imagine such alliances? Jews with right-wing leaders? But then there's the reality, huh? I mean, after all, these Muslim masses are moving into Europe and they're bringing with them, there's no doubt about it, anti-Jewish feelings. Oh. <laughs> so I was at a meeting in September where there were all these French Jewish intellectuals. I can't, tortured? <laughs> they're on the left. So they get up and what they say is, well, there's no anti-Semitism. It's just that these people are just hostile to, to Israel and, and so forth and so on. Well, if that's the case, somebody said to them, why is it that in April of 2002, they're burning down synagogues? In Marseille, they bur burned down a synagogue. It was done by Muslim immigrants. And they drove a car through the main gate of the synagogue in Lyon. And they burned the main door of the chief synagogue in Strasbourg. And in fact, Orthodox Jews, who are very visible as Jews, walking the streets in some of these suburbs uh, where they live, the poor suburbs, are assaulted by the Muslim kids. Hmm. Is that simply anti-Israel or is that anti-Jewish? I mean, and after all, if you know that the demonization process is going on, it, it creates this incredible problem. So, so now, let me just look at the realities. The reality is that there's no doubt about it. There is a rise of anti-Semitism in, uh, in Europe right now. That's evidence from... Um, the assaults and some of the violence and the desecration of cemeteries, there is a rise. The, the presence of anti-Semitism is not only on the right, it presently is in what we call the, 
the heirs of, uh, of the new left. And it's focused supposedly on the issue of Israel and the, the Palestinians, but you find three things that go together in terms of propaganda. Anti-Americanism, anti-globalization, and hostile statements about Jewish power. Though those three generally go together in the, in the propaganda. Uh, and uh, the Muslim population, which is a, among the most oppressed and indeed needs rescue, contains the seeds of much of this hostility. It would be as though in this country the major haters of blacks were Hispanics. Do you understand? Two, vul two, vul two vulnerable uh, populations. And by the way, there has been hostility between uh, uh, the, two, uh, the two communities. So there's this continuous dispute, and that was present when the French intel Jewish intellectuals were there, was, uh, is it anti-Israel? Is it anti-Semitic? Well, the problem is that the propaganda doesn't just talk about Israelis, it talks about Jews, and not only Jews in Israel, but Jews all over the, Jews all over the world. And one of the realities is that an odd alliance was being proposed, an alliance between the right the far right and the Jews because they share uh, an enemy? I do want to tell you that the leadership of the Jewish community rejected, <laughs> uh, rejected the offer, but the very fact that it was what offered indicates to you how bizarre this development is. So I want to conclude by simply asking, what is the significance of this all? The significance is that there has been a shift of the center of anti-Semitic propaganda from the European world to the Muslim world, and then it has returned to Europe mainly through the immigration that has come from the Muslim world, to the anti-Semitism is now non-establishment. The reason why the French intellectuals never encounter it is very simple. In Paris, Jews can live anywhere the 8th arrondissement, the 16th arrondissement, they can have any job, they can go anywhere, the whole thing. The Sorbonne at the university, is there any discrimination? No, there's no discrimination. See, historically, the people who were anti-Semitic were the people on top. And they kept the Jews what? Down, no, go. In fact, if you were simply uh, prosperous and well-educated, you could function in this world with absolutely no experience of anti-Semitism. The irony is that anti-Semitism has now shifted to the, to the bottom. And in fact, that's, that's where it is. And if you are a poor Orthodox Jew living in an Arab neighborhood, then, then what? Then, if you're the rich Jew in the 8th arrondissement, you're what? You're fine, you're in Bloomfield Hills. You're okay. It's not in Bloomfield Hills that the problem is, it's in Melvindale. And nobody in Bloomfield Hills who's Jewish wants to live in Melvindale, so it's, so it's not a problem. But those people who are forced to live in Melvindale, do you understand, then it's a problem. Everything has been turned on its head. Everything has been turned upside down. And quite frankly, there's no doubt that if the Palestinian-Israeli situation could be partially resolved, there would be a reduction, no doubt, of what we call anti-Semitic hostility. But I do want to tell you, Osama bin Laden and the Muslim fundamentalists who follow him will not under any circumstances accept a state of Israel. And their propaganda is very clear. The state of Israel only exists, and American power only exists, and is only used because it's, what it's controlled by this parasitic force called uh, the Jewish uh, conspiracy. That propaganda will continue no matter what. So I want to conclude with a statement. Uh, first, for the overwhelming majority of the Jews of the world, 
living outside of Israel, they are perfectly safe unless you live in a poor neighborhood, Muslim neighborhood. Right? In, in France somewhere or whatever. You're fine. You know, perfectly fine. But uh, the vulnerability of the Jews is now to be found in a population that is in itself oppressed. And that makes the problem ethically all the more what? All the more difficult because I mean, how, how do you arbitrate? Will it mean that Jews on the whole will become more conservative in their politics as a result? It's already happening a little bit in the United States of America, the movement from the, the Democratic to the Republican parties, and it is also happening a little bit in France and in other parts of Europe. I don't know. All I know is that in the, at the end of the 19th century, with deep roots, an ideology was let loose into the world. It had horrible consequences which led to the murder of six million people. And at the end of World War II, we imagined that it might go away. Uh, and for all practical purposes in the Western world, it has gone away. But that's not true in the Third World. There it lies, and the immigrants of the, of the Third World can bring it into the, into the European world. And now the great dilemma for which I do not have the answer, is how to meet the ethically legitimate needs of oppressed Muslim immigrants in Europe and simultaneously to oppose the force, the evil force of anti-Semitism. When I get the complete answer, I'll give another talk. Thank you very, very much.